Namaste. Namaste. Let us pray. Father, Mother, Life, you are my life, my constant support, my health, my protection, my perfect fulfillment of every need, and my highest inspiration. I ask you to reveal the true reality of yourself to me. I know it is your will that I shall be fully illumined, that I may better receive awareness of your presence within and around me. I believe and know that this is possible. I believe that you protect and maintain me with perfect love. I know that my eventual purpose is to express you. As I speak to you, I know that you are perfectly receptive of me, for you are universal loving intelligence, which has so marvelously designed this world and brought it into visible form. I know that as I ask you to speak to me, I am sending out a consciousness searchlight into your divine consciousness. And as I listen, you will be penetrating my human consciousness and coming ever closer to my increasingly receptive mind and heart. I commit myself and my life into your care. Amen. Amen. That prayer was from Christ's letters. A book called Christ Returns is a result of nine letters channeled in the year 2000 to an 80-year-old lady, I would love this, who had been hearing from Jesus since her 20s in England. And at the age of 80, she was told that her life's mission was to have purified herself sufficiently that she may receive without question the words that he intended to bring to humanity at this important time. And so in the year 2000, she channeled nine letters. Those letters are now available on the internet for free. They've been translated into other languages. You can Google Christ letters, there's nine of them. There's also an extraordinary website that I refer to called Christ Has Returned. Dot w -E -E -B -L -Y, Weebly. And that takes me to a site that has probably the best index and reference of his information. And what he says in his letters is this. He is the one who came and did what said he did in the Bible. The message in the Bible, in the New Testament, however, is not the message that he gave. He said, what happened to him in the desert? What happened to him when he got baptized was so extraordinarily different that no matter how hard he tried to tell those around him, his disciples, the people who came to listen and witness the miracles, could not believe the words of what he was saying. And what he said he experienced was this. When he was baptized, he was transformed with a blood of light that raised him up into a higher vibration than he had ever, ever could have conceived. Of. He said this was not what he was expecting at all. He had gone there to be baptized and he thought it would make him a easier person and it would help him along and help mend his relationship with his parents and his friends that he had. He said when he stumbled out of that water after the baptism into the desert, into the 60 days, into the six weeks that are mentioned in the Bible, he said he was not tempted by the devil. He was not tempted by power. He was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He said he saw that the world that we see as solid was moving. It was pure energy in constant motion. He said he saw that this world of shimmering light and energy was filled with knowledge and creation. It was all-knowing, 
all striving towards ultimate perfection. It was self-nurturing, self-protecting, self-directing. And he said when his mind began to doubt it, the shimmering stopped and would revert. And then when he let his doubts go, the shimmering continued. And he said, that's how he realized how powerful our thoughts are. When he left the six weeks in the desert, he thought, now I can tell my fellow man and women the truth of it. We suffer not because of an avengeful God. We suffer not because of, quote, sins we have done. We suffer because of our erroneous thoughts. That were we to not think at all, it would revert to, as Reverend Inga Mason said, a rest in God in which all would become perfect once again. Filled with this feeling of revelation, he thought, now I can bring healing to a world so in need of suffering. And so began the ministry of what we believe to be Jesus the Christ. And three years later, he was crucified because of it. The disruption to the present power structure, the church and the politics were so strong that he was crucified. He said at the time, he now he realizes that the world could not accept what he was saying just as much as he could not convey what he was saying because it was so extraordinary. And so he returned to these letters in the year 2000 to tell us the truth of what he really meant, what he really did say. And all he really did say was attempt to tell us the revelation of truth, protection, fulfillment that he received in his enlightenment in the desert. And as he put it, he did say that. But much has been lost in the telling. What has happened since Christ's life and his crucifixion? Well, I have a little article here. <laughs> You're going to love this. <laughs> Which religion is responsible for the greatest number of deaths of infidels over its entire history? <laughs> Right. Christianity. Christianity. Now, what we don't realize is we might think it's the Muslims, and the Muslims are on the list too. <laughs> but Islam is merely a diver, diver, uh, derivation of Christianity. Muhammad came as a prophet of Jesus. He was trying to tell the Arabs about this Jew who had this extraordinary message. <laughs> he was, in a way, the same as Joseph Smith of the Mormons. Another prophet who attempted to revive in his own way the New Testament belief and tell them about Jesus. Of he said they had lost the message. So everything has derived from the story of the life of Jesus. Christians, Muslims, and whatever. <laughs> well, the whatever is a significant part of it. <laughs> this book goes through this whole litany of our past 2,000 years. This is a, it's not a book, it's a little site. And it said, it added up, and I think it was probably by the 1800s, 200 years ago, that uh, by that time, there was 15 million deaths for Christianity, Jews fighting Protestants, Protestants fighting Christians, Catholics, just everybody fighting because they believed differently. And he said by that time, the numbers were total, drum roll, 15 million deaths for Christianity, and a mayor of two million for Islam. <laughs> but he said, these numbers were soon to be knocked out of the box by whatever. In China, in 1850, 
A poor farmer read the Gospels, or he heard of the Gospels, and became filled with the belief that he was a younger brother of Jesus Christ. And so he set out to convert the heathen Chinese. Twenty million dollars. <laughs> One war in China, which we know nothing about, also associated with the Gospels of Jesus, took out the entire number of deaths of Christianity and the Muslims. And we didn't even know about it. Now here we are in the year 2016. And Jesus the Christ has returned to give us the true meaning of his life. And as he said, of what I said before, his true meaning is that, as Reverend Inga Mason said, that the nature of this reality is pure love, consciousness itself. That is self-protecting, self-creating, self-perpetrating, self-moving towards the Godhead, and that it is only our thoughts that interfere with the process. Because we are co-creators, because we were given free will, this is what our thoughts have done. But he said, he has come back at this time because the need is great, and two, the times have changed. We are here, and this is what I wanted to say to all of you today who are sitting in this room. And this is true to everybody on the planet at this time. Evidently, the rate of vibration, of consciousness, of humanity is changing at a time to be receptive for the first time on a mass level of the true message of the Christ manifested through the individual that came to us in the form of Jesus. There is a, uh, we, we speak about metaphysics, okay? And metaphysics, in a way, is the explanation, in, explanation of the physical world. And in very many ways, physics, quantum physics, the world of physics, and religion have been very far apart. And that is true. Because each, each says, I am the truth. I am the truth. Even though science keeps changing, it believes that whatever its latest discovery is is the truth, it takes another discovery and throws that one out. Just as religion constantly changes. The rapture, what it showed up in a suburb 40 years ago, and now that has caught hold of billions of Americans. All right? Washed in the blood of the Lamb. I was raised in a church American Baptist the gospel of Jesus in it. And it added a little caveat. Sure, you must proclaim your belief in Jesus the Christ. But unless you, by public demonstration, are baptized in the presence of God and your fellow man, no go, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that cuts a lot of people out of the game. <laughs> All right? So everybody had their own little doorway. But what is happening is this. There has recently become a joining, though I don't think they have quite figured it out yet, between physics and metaphysics. Now, everybody in this room is a metaphysician. It took a long struggle for you to get in that seat that you're in. You had to leave the tradition in which you were born. You had to think and dispense with ideas that were told you as true and go, don't sound right to me. And your inner self led you further and further along. And so we have been told in this room, thought creates. As a man thinketh, so it is. You are the creator of your world. Now I want to read you something for quantum mechanics as a chief. Quantum mechanics. I can't even think of what that stuff means. And I want to call it. Man. 
Physicist John Wheeler was a professor at Princeton. And I lecture a lot, I talk a lot in economics. Ben Bernanke came from Princeton. And he was as wrong about finances as Wheeler seemed to be right about this reality. When Wheeler was at Princeton, he was there when Einstein came at the latter part of his life. And he's a loom, one of the luminaries and probably one of the fathers of what we call quantum mechanics. This is the ultimate state of where physicists say reality is. In an interview with Wheeler titled, Does the Universe Exist If We're Not Looking? According to the rules of quantum mechanics, our observations influence the universe at the most fundamental levels. You understand what he's saying? This is quantum mechanics speak for metaphysics. We are very comfortable and we understand and we accept the statement that our thoughts create reality. This is not a man sitting in his room. This is a man at the very edge of the study of reality from the viewpoint of science itself. Quote, the boundary between an objective world out there and our own subjective consciousness that seems so clearly defined in physics before the eerie discoveries of the 20th century blurs in quantum mechanics. When physicists look at the basic constituents of reality, atoms and their innards, <laughs> atoms and their innards, love that <laughs> metaphor, or the particles of light called photons, what they see depends on how they have set up their experiment. In other words, what they see is not dependent on some objective thing out there, what they see is how they set up their perception. A physicist's observation determines whether an atom, say, behaves like a fluid wave or a hard particle, or which path it follows in traveling from one point to another. From the quantum perspective, the universe is an extremely inter- On April 21st in 2016, in an article in Quantum Magazine titled, The Evolutionary Argument Against Reality. God, they're getting there, folks. <laughs> quantum mechanics, quantum physicists marveling at the strange fact that quantum systems don't seem to be definite objects localized in space until we come to observe them. Experiment after experiment has shown define common sense. That if we assume that the particles that make up ordinary objects have an objective, observer-independent existence, we get the wrong answers. The central lesson of quantum physics is clear. There are no public objects sitting out there in some pre-existing space. Well, what does that mean about our world? What does that mean about the election? What does that mean about our economic system? <coughs> what does that mean about the future? That, my friends, is a mass hallucination of which we have a part. We are all a part of that mass hallucination. Reality in the universe, as we experience it, only as we experience it, other sentient consciousness experience this phenomena in totally different ways. But here, confined to a time-space continuum, our perceptions have something in, in common. One, our universes, our world, are unique to ourselves. Just as this moment, each of you is in my world out there. I am in your world. Some person might be out there in the depths of despair, 
trembling with fear, afraid beyond any possible feeling that they've ever had before. And the person next to him is sitting there in contemplation of the divine. Each of those worlds exists. Each of those worlds is discrete and separate. Each of those consciousness has created its own state. And there is no judgment on one state or the other from the viewpoint of consciousness itself. The despair of that first party may be the very thing that person needs to move into divine consciousness. There is no judgment in reality itself. But what this implies for each of us as we move into this time together, there is a rendering coming. And this is what Jesus the Christ has said. He said, since his leaving the earth plane 2,000 years ago, there's been much progress made. He said, if you look back on it, when he was here, there was no institutions to take care of people. If you were weak, you died. You had family, but that was it. There was no social intention of care. And now, as tattered as they are, it seems almost to be, at least, if not a right, that it should be. He said, you have made tremendous progress in the care for each other. But at the same time, the divisiveness of the ego reality that controls human thought has grown even more powerful in its effects because of technology and mass communication. At this time, we are moving towards a resolution of the anger, rages, fears, and terror that people have held in their consciousness. And what Jesus said, they will out. Just as much as you cannot affect my reality, nor the reality of the person next to you, and even yourself, unless you are very, very, very clever. You cannot affect the mass consciousness one iota, except holding it in the light. And other than doing that, you have no effect at all. Why? Because your free will does not allow you to do that. Just like the universal law allows nobody else's will to affect yours. We heard last month the Zoroastrians had as one of the fundamental tenets the meaning of free will. And so it is. And so we are at a point where Jesus the Christ has come through these letters to remind us, to tell us, as these times are coming on to us, we are going to need to think as we never or, as he would put it in the letters, not think. We have to stop those thoughts that are catapulting this into destruction. Parts of this world will be destroyed. Parts of this world need to be destroyed. There are elements of darkness that have been on this plane that are going to leave. And the institutions that have given them birth and form are going to leave with them. Selfishness, war, greed, and cruelty are going to leave for the kingdom of heaven is coming. But it's not something that's going to happen as mass consciousness. It's going to happen because each one of you will do that for yourself. Each one of you here has come at this time to take up the challenge of the crises that confronts not just humanity, but yourself. You are not responsible for those around you in, on their path. You are responsible to care for them. But you cannot make choices for them. They have the free will to do whatsoever they choose. But what we need to do is to reconnect to a divine source in a real way. This is the meaning of meditation. The meaning of meditation is to go silent. Because as Christ said, it is in the silence that creation comes. It is in our silence that we connect with the silence of it, the source of it, 
the source of us. We are not the victims of the world that we have been birthed into. Though I believe that for a long time. We are the co-creators. And in that lies our salvation and our responsibility. Christ says here, he has some rules. <laughs> rules. Well, I think we need a few guidelines at this moment. <laughs> Daily reading of the Christ given rules and explanations are important. Meditation. Quieting yourself to reconnect. No thoughts, no judgments, no opinions. Silence. Rest. And as you rest in God, you allow others to rest also. Rest in God. Set, next one. Reject all ego thoughts and replace them with thoughts of compassionate love and unconditional love. The ego, Christ explains, was a gift of creation of individuation. It was like puberty in the process of childhood to adulthood. And let me assure you, we've all been through it, and none of us are fond of that experience. So it is with our ego growth. We grew strong in it. It allowed us to move. It allowed us to choose. But there was a point of which we are forced to give it up. And if we don't, we succumb to the drives of the ego, of self-centeredness, selfishness, and self-importance. Next, make meaningful contact with other people. Listen to them and stop bringing the subject back to yourself. This is one of the ways of moving beyond ego. Open yourself to hear what other people are saying. Simply that. You are part of a great consciousness. You are joined to them. The ego has isolated ourselves to our own needs, our own neuroses, our own fears. Break free of it. Hear truths about yourself without hiding behind a cloak of excuses and indulging in retaliation. Again, more ego defenses must need to be let go. Be truthful and straightforward. Otherwise, my consciousness will be fragmented and I will lack conviction. <laughs> Daily I must remember and affirm that in the kingdom of heaven, tomorrow is always perfect. Next. Avoid all alarmist thought. To build the kingdom of heaven within and without myself, I must withdraw my consciousness from everything which I do not want to see repeated or perpetrated in the future. This is not to say that it does not exist, as some New Agers are wont to say. This is to say, don't continue it. Don't feed it. Because if we move into the final days, the flare-ups are going to be more intense. The splitting between the goats and the sheep is becoming more marked. The resolution of the battle between light and dark is clear, nearing resolution. See the light. The dark exists. Don't feed it. Nor should you deny it. Listen to all who seek your love and comfort. And ask divine consciousness to give you the words to heal their heart, their hurt. You do not know what they mean. The words that have helped you on your path may not be the words they need now. They may not need the advice that you have to give. They do need sustenance. They do need comfort. They do need words. The divine source within you will give you those words to give them. Do not give away to jealousy because everything that is necessary for you to have in your care and happiness is yours when you ask Father, Mother, 
And he says daily, say this affirmation. I open my heart and mind to divine consciousness transcendent to help me dissolve all present selfish ego drive. Daily I open my soul to receive divine consciousness to assist me in building a new era of love and peace in the world. In the kingdom of heaven, only divine love, divine compassion, joy and laughter and beauty of self-expression will be sublimely manifested all. Nature in every area of the world will flourish luxuriantly, harmoniously, supplying fruits and food for every single person on earth. All people will be well fed. All will be well clothed. All will be uplifted in spirit. And all will manifest divine consciousness in every way, every day. I lift this vision of felicity to divine consciousness where it will be ignited with divine life for its perfect manifestation on earth. I give my loving thanks to my source that even now it is all beginning to, shape, to take shape in the unseen. Thank you. We are the Blessed One. We are the one that have been brought to carry the light. We are the one that have been chosen to transform our world from the worlds that we are li have lived in to the kingdom of heaven. It is not going to happen in mass consciousness without our participation. Everything that you have learned has brought you here to this moment. It is what you need to do that will take this world into this place of sublime peace love, abundance, and beauty that has been referred to as the kingdom of heaven. In his talk, Christ talked about the ego, and I want to talk about Aisha and some other observation of it. From a channel called Aisha, I, I love this lady. She channeled a group of people called the Constant Companions, and this is what she had to say. Remember that mere words does not entail that you have made a choice. It is a voice inside of you that will decide if you will continue to stick around at the old timeline, or if you are willing to take this leap of faith and connect your essence with the new. It might sound as if it is an easy thing to do. The ego might not have battled it out just yet. And you might have to take that final stand sooner than you thought. In other words, this is not like choosing a new car or a new job. This is about choosing to listen to your soul or forever stay trapped inside the world dictated by your ego. And never forget, the ego fears nothing so much as being obliterated by a strong soul. Therefore, it will do anything to make you think it. So many have been tricked into thinking that they have finally been able to remove any last vestiges of that old and insistent voice inside, only to find them still, still trapped in patterns of behavior set up to inhibit them from finding their own power. Criticism is one of these things that the ego does. And it is not that you see, what you see out there is not true. It is not yours to tell the other person. It is wrong. When you do that, the ego of the other person exists and becomes strengthened. And so does yours. Trust yourself. Because if you go deep inside, you will find the truth in this. And if necessary, you will find the strength to sever this connection to the old once and for all. This might sound like old advice. But believe us when we say that never has it been more appropriate because now the time has come for boarding the train for those of you brave enough to step into the new. We journey together. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.